The house stood about here. So many houses, so many names. Names which will mean nothing to you, gentle viewer, but for me are part of the very fabric of my life. Albert Drake, John Hughes, Jimmy Preston, who was considered a real boy and whom I envied. Barbara May, who, wearing a stiff dress with multicolored squares on it, would stand outside Charlie Burnell's shop and sing Danny Boy. Mary Carroll, whose hair I used to pull. All, all are gone. The old familiar faces. Your tea's ready, Kev. Okay, ma'am. All right, ma'am. Hiya, ma'am. Hey, John, will you get the plantains out for me? Yeah, okay, Titch. What's up, Mum? The pictures. Where else? Your new film, The Long Day Closes, is partly about a boy discovering the cinema, and that's very important to the film. Can you remember when you discovered the cinema and the impact it had on you? Yes, I can remember it vividly. Um, I had never been to the cinema at all because I wasn't allowed out, because my father was very, very strict, and he died in 1953 when I was seven. And my elder sister took me to the Odeon in Liverpool, and it was to see Singing in the Rain, and which was such a joy. I mean, the only thing I could remember um, was the, the, the title sequence, um, when he does the title number, In the Rain. And I just fell in love with the cinema then, uh, but I fell in love with American cinema. Um, I, I went, was then taken to see every musical that was ever made um, from then on. Um, simply because my sisters loved American musicals, and of course so did I. And we'd even read the credits. I mean, my sister would say, I see Bud Westmore's done the makeup, and I'd say, yes, and that's fabulous. You know, as though we knew him. Um, but it was such a joy, because America was the land of magic. It was colour. Um, England was very grey. But the real, the real joy was seeing American musicals, and particularly Doris Day. Love? Are you nuts? Some people can't tell when it hits them. <laughs> say hello to a man and they've got you whispering in his ear all you gotta do it seems is work for him and they've got you going berserk for him if there's a guy you merely have a beer with they've got you setting the wedding date it seems they've just gotta have some dirt to bend your ear with so before you start I hear with State. That she was not at all in love, but I was. Why particularly Doris Day? She seemed to embody those, that world of the perfect family. Like, for instance, Young at Heart, which is all shot in the studio mainly. Very, very little location. Even a lot of the exteriors are shot on sound stages, which had this incredible kind of glow about it. And I just thought, oh, isn't she wonderful? Isn't she just so wonderful? And I desperately wanted to be Doris Day, and still do. <laughs> do you practice? <laughs> well, only at home with the windows closed. <laughs> My mother used to love those films because of the kitchens. <laughs> <laughs> They're such wonderful kitchens. Yes. <laughs> and, and I used to love the wraparound teeth. <laughs> Did this, when you came out of the cinema, were you coming out into, was Liverpool wet and grimy and on austerity and in trouble, or was it suddenly the Hollywood of the west coast of England? Well, it was terribly grimy and very very hard. We were a large working class family. But those films transformed your surroundings. Suddenly you saw them in a new light. Suddenly you'd look at the way the street was after rain. And it just seemed so glowing and wonderful. I seem to sigh. I'm in heaven. You, Mavis. What are you running for? Is the lodge was chasing me. 
Why? I was just getting them. You be careful. One day he'll catch you and give you a right go along. You mentioned working class family. It was a large family. I believe there were ten children. Yes. And you were the youngest. Yes, I was. And your father died when you were seven. Your father was an extraordinarily brutal man. Well, he was, I, th I think, quite, quite mentally disturbed. And she was no bleeding. Um, uh, when he was younger, I mean, he just he'd physically abuse people, and particularly my mother. But the rest of us, I think, were um, mentally um, abused, in the sense that um, it was a kind of terror which reigned. Um, I could go into the parlour at four or five, and I knew whether he was in a good mood or not. And, you know, if he wasn't in a good mood and you could sense it like that, what you did was you kept your head down and tried not to be noticeable. I just remember being frightened all the time. Um, and um, then he began, he began to get very ill when I was um, five. And he died at home. He died of cancer, and it took two years for him to die. So what was also awful was the fact that, you know, uh, he was suffering from that stomach cancer and those days I mean, they gave you morphine and it wore off and they wouldn't give you another one till your next prescribed injection and he would be screaming like an animal. Do you have any feelings now? I mean, if you met him, would you, as it were, try to understand him, or would you try to... What would you do? I don't... I don't think I've reached a level of maturity where I try to understand him. Um, I went through a period when I was incredibly angry at what he'd done to my mother, because my mother's full of love, and to do that to someone, I just think it's... I think it's vicious. And I went through a period where I was just so angry that, I mean, had he been around, I would have killed him, quite cheerfully choked him. Um, because nobody should be allowed to um, do what he did to not only her, to his entire family, because we've all been affected by that malign influence. We'll have a happy ending now, taking a chance on love. After your father's death when you were seven, there seems to be an instant swing into enormous happiness for the next four years. Is that, in fact, what happened? It was so wonderful because we began to live, you know, I mean, uh, and the house was a kind of magnet, um, and uh, those days um, it was very swish if you were a girl to actually have a yank as a boyfriend, and my sister had a, an American seaman called Jimmy Francisco, I think his name was, who had been brought up in Boston and who had gone to school with Bruce Roman, a film star, and he came down the street in a white suit. I'll never forget that. A white suit in the middle of Liverpool in 1954, for heaven's sake, and brought us peanut butter, nylons, and Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum, and a percolator for coffee, but we didn't know how to use it, so we used it for paint. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gathered in the back kitchen on Friday nights, my sisters and their friends and my brothers in the lean-to. I was allowed to go for the girls' makeup. Well, did you get me stuff for me? Yeah, two pairs of nylons, 15 then, yeah. Well, American well, tan, fully fashioned. Right, I'll have a Pants, thin, and nail wash. Majestic red. Yeah, imperial leather, picture go and picture show. Evening in Paris. I like that. I didn't have any. Then out they'd go through the front door, leaving a trail of perfume shoulder high behind them. My brothers laughing to the pub, giving me money and chocolate. The sheen of electricity over everything and waiting for them to come home late. Leave it alone, you two. Magic Fridays. And then the, uh, the gate closed again when you went to secondary school. And I've read that you said that you think you were bullied every day you were at that school for the next four or five years. I was, I was beaten up every single day. And I think by that time, I'd probably lost my accent. And I thought I sounded like everybody else. In actual fact, you know, I sounded like Phyllis Calvert, you know? <laughs> Which is pretty depressing and if you come from a working class area. And um, they just picked on me and I was the victim and that was it. And I didn't tell a soul. Who's a fruit then? 
Hey, it's Al Capone, isn't it? Hey, your name's Al Capone, isn't it? <laughs> Al Capone. Uh... <laughs> when uh, the boys are hitting him, they're saying fruit, aren't they? Was that part of the, uh, as they saw it, the difference? And was that the reason why they could victimize you? That was one way of getting at you. And because if you were a sissy, I mean, that was the, the worst thing that you could be um, told. And it conveyed a, gr convey a great deal of hatred, a real, a real hatred for what you are, or what they think you are not. Have you seen these blokes since? Well, ironically, I was making the second part of the trilogy and was shooting in West Derby Road in Liverpool. And I was waiting outside this shop, and this bloke came along, and I thought, he's one of them, his name was McCabe. And he stopped. And he said, what are you doing? I said, we're making a film. He said, um, who's, what do you do? I said, I'm directing it. And we had this long conversation, and he didn't recognize me. And I thought, you made my life misery. You made my life absolute misery, and you can't even remember. That's what was so, that was even more depressing, you know, because you think it was done almost to, to pass the time. Um, and it's affected my life, and you know, you think, how could you have done it? How could you have done it? I mean, all children are cruel. I mean, I was, I wasn't by no means a saint, no Frank of Assisi here, but I mean, I didn't do that to anybody. When you came from a Catholic family and went to a Catholic school, this is the mid fifties when I presume those schools were still rigorous and very Catholic prayers at the beginning and the end of the day and uh, mm. a lot of sin, a lot of confession and so on. Did it um, dominate your inner life, that Catholicism? The damage, of course, is done in primary school, when it, 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 it's much more insidious. Why do you say damage? Well, because what they tell you is that you have this thing called a soul, and it is in danger, and it, it already comes into the world um, stained by original sin, and you, you have to get rid of that original sin, and you have to keep your soul pure um, and free from sin, whether it's venal or mortal. And it's impossible to live by the tenets of you have to be pure in thought, word, indeed, it's not possible. Even saints can't do it. Um, even though I gave up when I was 22, I'm still full of do's and don'ts and oughts and ought not to's. Because I, if I lie or, because I don't lie, I try to be as honest as I can, I know that God will know, and I don't even believe in him, and I know that he'll know. It's absurd. You never get rid of it. Well, I'm filming here because I worshipped here for 17 years, and this was my parish church. Um, I worshipped here from the age of five. My sort of um, crise de coeur occurred here, over there. <laughs> I'm a fun person at the party tonight. Well, I suppose it, it must have had a sub subconscious role, because I'm, I'm obsessed with symmetry. Um, altars are very symmetrical, the idea of, you know, the three godheads in one and all this. All these things are very, very symmetrical. Surrounded by these images of high Catholic revival, you're impregnated with it from a very, very early age. And so it must go into your subconscious in some way and at such a deep level that you're not aware of it. Am I in the right place? Um... You can't recreate it the way it was. You can't, you can only scratch at it really when i was here when i was came to quarantine with my mother i mean i wasn't sitting in the pew i'm um, thinking well you know in 30 years time i'm gonna use 100 mil on this on this shot with my mum and i i mean you can't because you don't so it is different it is different you can only recreate its essence which is not the same thing but that's good because you recreate a memory of of something and that's that's more fascinating because it takes on extra meaning Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I give you my body and blood. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, assist me in my last agony. May I say, when I am dying, Jesus, mercy, Mary, help. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Had you any ambitions to stay on at school? 
or this various forms of terrorization, internal and external, just put you off mm. the whole but, but business also, But else. also, oh, I mean, in those days, you know, you left at 15, and, you know, the, the only kind of career guidance you got, you know, you, you went into the corridor, and this man from the youth employment office said, um, uh, this is your academic record, you will go into an office, and I went into a shipping office, because that's what I was told to do. So I was there a year, and then I got into an accountancy practice, where I was there for a long time. For about 12 years, I'm yes. sure. Did you do anything after the weekend? No. And always the gentlewomen <laughs> gliding past in blue or beige or multicolored blouses, their hair falling and their shy smiles above the coffee cups, writing, typing, signing invoices, which in correspondence racks stretch down the entire length of one wall. Invoices for flags the doors leading to the quiet factory where they spin the flags of every nation. Flags to go all over the world. To Norway, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Singapore, Iraq, and the blue ensign for Australia and the warm Polynesian seas southeast of the equator. 35, 39, 40, and running to sea. You stayed with your mother in a council flat, that's right. And in yes. the films, there's a very tender uh, relationship between yourself and your mother, which I think might be hard for some people who don't come out of that particular culture to understand. Is that based on your own experience with your mother? It was very, very close. I mean, sometimes we, we got... Sometimes it, there was friction, I mean, especially when I went to drama school and came back and I began to change, and that relationship began to change, and it was, there was a friction for quite some time which then worked itself out. But um, I, I didn't want to leave home. I mean, I forced myself to. Sitting quietly in this quiet room, high above Corporation Liverpool, their fingers drumming silently in the silent flat and the folded bed and the smell of age. Cheap cut glass, white and orange, along the clotted sideboard. The very moquette faded to the touch and the gathering dark. A fair lit. With nothing to say. Well, oh, um... And I know that out of that, uh, in your late twenties or whatever it was, you became a filmmaker, you went around. Now that, for most people in that sort of background, is an almost inconceivable leap, which requires energy, guile, tunnel vision, obstinacy, whatever. How did that start? Well, it happened by, in a way, by accident. I mean, because I, originally I wanted to act and write. And I bought the stage every Thursday, those days. And I thought, the next time I open it, I'm going to look at the first drama school I see and I'm going to apply. I'd applied to others and had never got in because every time I came down to London it was so depressing. I found it so terrifying. Um, and going to places like RADA, you know, where you know, my name was called out as Teresa Davis and I had to say, no, look, it's Terence, you know, despite the rumours. <coughs> um, that was terribly depressing. I and mean, I did something like, I, I, and I did, what did I do? I did Lord Foppington from The Relapse. <gasps> Jesus. And so at 10 o'clock, I say, I rise. Now, if I find it's a good day, I resolve to take a turn in the park and see the fine women, so huddle on my clothes and get dressed by one. If it be nasty weather, I take a turn in the chocolate house. Where as you walk, madam? And in the middle of the stage was on the bottom right-hand corner for Coventry Drama School. It was a completely third-rate drama school, but I got in. But I'm afraid I tire the company. I had written the year before I'd gone up to drama school, Children, the first part of the trilogy, mm. and sent it all over England, and everyone turned it down. So I thought, oh, well, you know, it can't be any good. Um, and I, came, I used to go home every three weeks then in my first year, and there was a thing on BBC called Cinema Now, and the very last one was about the BFI production board, and they gave money. So off I sent my script. And a year later, um, Mamoun Hassan asked me oh, to go yeah. down, and I got down the... And he said, you have eight and a half thousand pounds, not a penny more, you will direct. I said, I've never directed before. He said, now's your chance. And I was terrified. And it was an absolute baptism by fire. But that's how it happened. Oh, God, I remember. 
for the first time I looked down the camera lens and I got, I was so excited by what I saw. And something happens between photographing what you've looked at and the things that you've left out. Some magic happens. Mm. And I didn't know what it was. I still don't. That's why it's so wonderful. And I thought, God, I would like to do it. So I thought, well, I'll apply to film school, the National Film School. And I got in on the second occasion. Thank goodness. Robert! There's no need to run inside the school. No, sister. There were certain films by certain directors that I couldn't live without. I couldn't live without Cries and Whispers um, by Bergman. I couldn't live without Night of the Hunter um, by Charles Lawton. I couldn't live without Letter from an Unknown Woman. Um, all those things, because I, I, I think they're just wonderful films. Um, but the influence was the American musical. That's, that was my greatest influence. But the greatest thing... Can I just stop that? It would seem, if we showed at this point a clip, take a clip, any clip, uh, from that trilogy, and said the influence was the American musical, a lot of people would feel, well, what is the connection? What is the real connection there? You, if you'd said the influence was... Bergman, the influence as some of the 30s French directors, the influence as document. So where is it? Up to that point, I mean, I'd never seen any Curaçao. I had never seen any Bergman. Um, I'd only seen Letter from an Unknown Woman on television and Night of the Hunter on television. I mean, a lot of it was close to me. I mean, a lot of cinema history was close to me. Um, and so I, it, went, it was on instinct. The trilogy was my apprentice work. I was learning my craft. And it very much is a, an apprentice work. There's many, many, many things wrong with it. Um, but those influences are, I can relate straight back to the American musical. If you remember the opening of Death and Transfiguration, mm -hmm. it's, it's a funeral and a cremation, and over which si Doris Day sings, it all depends on you, which is from Love Me or Leave Me. Sure. And, and trying to marry, trying to marry music to images, especially if the music is in complete contrast to what you're looking at. A frisson rises. I can save money or spend it, go right on living or end it. You're to blame, honey, for what I second year and he's just wonderful and I remember when we were cutting Madonna and Child he went to see a rough cut I wasn't there this particular weekend and um, he came out of the cutting room and someone said what have you been to see and he said Madonna and Child and they said it's a gay movie isn't it and he said not at the moment <laughs> <laughs> and I, re I reminded him of this and he roared with laughter it's such a wonderful put down <laughs> it was like when I finished the trilogy and it was first shown in America someone said these films making Mar Bergman look like Jerry Lewis <laughs> which is true <laughs> In 1988, with his film Distant Voices Still Lives, Terence Davis was suddenly acclaimed as one of Britain's best filmmakers. The film won the International Critics Prize at the Cannes Festival and was a great success, both here and abroad.
if um, the trilogy dealt in some parts with your childhood and uh, adolescence and early manhood and then an imagined end, uh, Distant Voices dealt with the time before you, uh, almost before you were born, but still with your family, your elder brothers, sisters, your father, who's a dominating personality in that film. Uh, what made you go there for the subject? I heard stories from my older s sisters and brothers, because they obviously needed to talk about the way he'd behaved. And those stories were so vivid, because they were all wonderful storytellers. I mean, really wonderful storytellers. And they were so vivid that they became sort of part of my memory. I felt as though almost I'd experienced them. Um, uh, and what, it, what the odd thing was that it made me feel that my family was incredibly unique. I thought they were the most wonderful family in the world, that they'd endured all this, and it was kind of so brave and courageous, and that my house seemed so magical, and we had nothing, but they made it magic. What were these stories? Well, uh, for instance, um, one time, w before I was born, my brother Kevin was a baby in arms, and um, my father would go into these black rages, but he would go very quiet beforehand. And my mother just thought one day he was going to go into one of these rages, and she just couldn't take it. So she picked up my brother Kevin, and she ran up the stairs to the first bedroom on the first floor, and he ran after her. And she opened the window, and she jumped out. And a soldier was passing, and he caught them. You know, I mean, if you, if, if you put that in a film, nobody would believe it. And sending those children up, my eldest brother and sister, to sell wood during the height of the, the May Blitz. You know, I mean, they were nearly killed. Tony, Very considerable um, a success in terms of gongs and reviews and so on. I don't know what sort of financial success it was. Um, Neither do I. It's difficult to, <laughs> always difficult to get the figures back, isn't it? And did it sort of go to your head, Terence? Well, no, it came as a surprise. I mean, it came as a surprise because we were um, the biggest revelation, and it reveals more about my psyche than anybody else, is when we went to, we were invited to the Kanzen at Cannes, and I heard that we had to watch the film. And I thought, oh, God, I can't do that. I can't, I can't be doing with this. And I actually did toy with the idea of getting a sick note from my mother. But I thought, no, I will be brave. I will go. So only a few people walked out. There was quite a lot of applause, some brothers. And I thought, well, thank goodness, that's over. And then Pierre Delot said, oh, come out. Will you come out into the um, foyer of the old Cosette Cinema, which is the last no longer there? Some people would like to see you. So I said, yes, thinking about eight people. Well, I go out, and it's crowded with cheering people. And he points to the stairs, which has got this red carpet down. And at first I thought, oh, God, he wants me to clean it. <laughs> and not a U-bank anywhere. And he said, no, you walked down, and so I did twice like the Queen Mother. It was absolutely wonderful. It was <laughs> transcendental and came as a complete surprise. In the, uh, the Hollywood version of your story, having had a success with distant voices, well, there you go. That's the rocket boost got you out of the clammy Earth's atmosphere. You're now away there, and more offers come planets are conquered and so on. What, what really happened about putting the next film together? It was extremely difficult um, because of what I wanted to do, of course, um, in, in terms of narrative and the shots, it would made it very expensive. Um, and really, we should have had 2.2 million pounds and we couldn't raise it. We simply couldn't raise it. The most we could raise was 1.75. The problem in England is that um, there's a very strong television culture. It's not matched by the cinema culture. Unlike America, it's not regarded as an industry. Unlike Europe, it's not a cultural entity. If you go to France, you will find that films like Jean de Florette will be number two in the sales. There's not the discrimination between a commercial and therefore successful film and an art house and therefore unsuccessful film. And so I think certainly in Europe, if um, uh, a film had done as well as Distant Voices did, there would have been no problem in raising the finance to the kind of budgets that we were looking for. Because we're a literary culture, we have never really understood the way the nature of images work. And that goes right through from 
the way writers write, the way producers produce. They will give money to people who write scripts where people tell them everything. But as I said, that's television, it's photograph theatre, it's not cinema. Um, any real piece of cinema tells you the story by what it reveals um, and the juxtaposition of images and the ambiguities which arise between those juxtapositions. That's understood everywhere but here. If you're trying to move in an area that does that, um, that is perhaps taking linear narrative a step further or uh, jettisoning, jettisoning um, linear narrative altogether for something which is elliptical or um, cyclical, you have, it's 20 times more difficult um, to get uh, that off the ground here. When you're being told the story by what people say, that isn't cinema. It does seem to me to be a, consciously or not, a differently styled movie from Distant Voices. Could you comment on that? I think um, much more, uh, there's much more choreography in the shots, in The Long Day Closes. Um, but it's very difficult to know how, if one does have a style, how that evolves, because you're so close to it. If there is a style, then I think there will set, be certain things which recur. Like, I, I love dissolves, but 96 frame dissolves because they're the longest ones and I like them. <laughs> you know, so I would, I, I would very rarely use a short dissolve mm. because what's lovely about um, a four second dissolve is you get an after image of the previous image that's actually going out. You just see it for a moment and then it goes, and I think that's just fabulously moving, for me, anyway. So I would always, uh, I would always use those, that length dissolve. Um, I like to track, but only when it's right. When you track, um, you're making a huge visual statement, not just getting from one part of the set to another. Um, and what I like um, is the idea of the denial of geography, both emotional and physical. And that was an idea which actually I got from um, the Leonard Bernstein uh, Norton lectures in the 70s, um, when he was, he was talking about it in a musical sense, um, where you hear, say, would we'll take the Adagiato from Mahler's Fifth Symphony, which I, I, I'm not musical, so I think it's written in the minor, but we'll say for argument's sake, it's written in the minor. Mm. It, after 15 minutes, it resolves to the major, but your inner harmonic knows what that resolution is, and when it comes, you melt, because it's what you've been waiting for. And I think, this, I think you can do that physically, you can do it in images. <laughs> If you're tracking and you travel left to right, the feeling is that you've gone forward in time. If you track from right to left, you always feel that you've gone backwards in time. Because we don't read that way. When a track is used properly to reveal something emotionally and visually and geographically, it is terribly exciting because you don't know where you are and then you do. Or you know where you are and then at the end of those series of tracks you might not know where you are, which is even better. Just as if you are in long shot from someone, when you go into close up you feel that there's something different is happening. Now why should you feel that? Nobody's told us that, but that's what we feel emotionally.
action. Action! The script is written I mean, so that every track, pan, dissolve, bit of music, bit of dialogue, everything is in there. And because the script is so detailed, I can say to someone, you know, we'll only use this part of the set or that part of the set. Those that day, we only need six extras, but there we need 50. Um, and, and you can husband your resources. Background action is always difficult because you, you don't want to make it too fussy. In a wide show, you can't just have one thing happening because, I mean, it looks bare and it looks underdressed. So you could have something that looks as though it's natural. Cut, but is natural enough so it doesn't detract from what you're looking at. Well, you know, I'm not that good on background action. I've never had it before. <laughs> Well, the set here is really a reconstruction from Terence Davis's memory of his street um, that he was brought up in as a child. And we've sort of psychoanalyzed it out of him almost and tweaked it up. There are no photographs extant at all of this street, so we've actually recreated it from his memory almost entirely. not actually a film about recreating the 50s so much, at least as far as I can see, the recreation of memory. And therefore, the street is not strictly realistic. When one's a child, you, you, everything is much crisper and livelier, and you go back afterwards and it's somehow flat. So I've tried to take that flatness out of it, just to lift it a little. For instance, the reveals of the doors and the windows, which are normally four inches deep, are six inches deep, and all sorts of curious little things like that. Even the bird droppings are fake, right? so there's absolutely nothing real that you see here at all. I rather like a minimalist approach myself. I like a very empty set. And the effect is reasonably convincing, I think, merely because we don't have millions and millions of period props everywhere, which I, I do think looks horrid myself. The reason we shot it in the studio is because all those places now are gone in Liverpool. They're all pulled down. Yeah, it's far, it's far. And I can't find streets that look yeah, anything like the one I grew up in. So that was the reason why we had to recreate it. This house that we've recreated, which is where I grew up, is very tiny. And ten of us were in this place. It's quite extraordinary. It's very odd to see your own house and your own childhood uh, being recreated in front of you. Yes, the reason there were no doors on any of the rooms is because my father took them off um, to make um, the lean-to roof and our parlor floor. And when we used to dance, he used to go up and down, you know, like a sprung floor. Um, uh, that's why we had no doors. Well, the scene we did this morning was a, con a conflation of uh, several uh, visual and emotional memories. Um, I used to watch my brothers mend their bicycles. I could never understand how a, a puncture kit worked. It's still a complete mystery to me. Um, and so I remember them making th these, these repairs to the bike, watching them, and then watching them ride up the street with their friends. And I wanted to conflate that scene um, so it was both a literal memory and an emotional memory as well. Because as I say, I do remember atmosphere and emotions with incredible accuracy, actually. I don't think I've got a photographic memory, but I've got a, a, a photographic emotional memory. The difficulty is, of course, that you've got actors who are not your brothers and who are not you, so they bring their own different things to it, like 
Lee today, who's playing me as a child, actually happened to pick up the inner tube. And I said, well, keep the inner tube. Ted says before they were seen, if you want to do anything what's natural to you, you just do it. But if it doesn't feel natural, just don't do it. Like, if there's something there to play with or fiddle with anything, I'd just do that and then just fit that in the scene as well, as my lines. You have to keep it open enough for the actors to bring their recreative skills to it. But also you have to contain the original emotional memory. So it's six of one and a half a dozen of the other, really. You take, take it slowly. There's nothing to do, nowhere to go. You really want to go with him. Don't, and don't rush it. Don't rush it at all. And can you drop your voice a little more? Uh, Lee, because it's still too high. The difficulty with, with Lee is that he's only 13 and his voice hasn't broken yet, so it, ta it can tend to go up in pitch. Now, a high-pitched voice from anybody, whether it's an adult or a child, is extremely monotonous. And coupled with the speed uh, of the Liverpool accent, you can't actually understand it. So I had to say, slow the speed down and lower the voice, otherwise we won't be able to hear you. Again, please, drop your voice. And when you do this, then touch that and then do that, not this. Then that, and it's too much. Just once, and then do that. Action. Are you going to cast Iron Chalk, Ev? No. Walton Woods? No. Walton Woods. With and Anthony, who was playing Russian Kevin, line, he tended to rush part of the dialogue and take the other part too slow. So you've got to say to Lee, you slow down and lower the voice. You speed up and keep yeah. the voice low. I mean, it's a, and then you've got to keep them within the frame because it's a static frame. The positions of their heads and hands are crucial. Are you going to cast Iron Chalk, Ev? No. What? Am I winding up in a frame? Can I go with you? Oh, I haven't got a fight for it, lad. Don't you see? Well, you been to some place back then? Yeah. I don't like it. <coughs> oh, it's horrible. Told you you wouldn't like it. Do you have a commercial market in your mind when you're making films? No. I mean, I have this constant thing at film school where they said, well, who are these films for? I said, well, I don't know. I don't know why people go to the cinema. Um, and, I mean... It was borne out by when the trilogy was finished and shown at the ICA, God bless them. And they put it in the main cinema and like three people and a cough turned up, you know. I don't know why people go. I have no idea why they go anymore. It's not like a captive audience as it was when I was growing up where you just went anyway because, you know, all there was was the radio and there was the cinema. And if you were grown up, there was the pub and the dance hall. Does this mean that you, you, you see filmmaking as a much more what our generation thinks of much more European, more private, more personal activity, nearer to writing poetry or writing a novel. Well, I mean, my feelings really are mixed. I mean, I'd love to make a musical. I'd love to make a romantic comedy. I want to make a thriller. Whether I'll be able to, I don't know, but that's what I want to do. I'd love to make a musical with 150 girls coming down, uh, with, oh, preferably 150 men coming down in tights and top hats. That would be really good. Um, but. I, I, that's not the way I see my own cinema. I mean, I hope that doesn't sound too pretentious, but I, I see it as an expression of what I need to say. Now, that, in a way, is private. It's much more subtle. It's much more... It's on a smaller scale. But because it's a small scale, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have, have to be small. It can be on a grand scale emotionally. You know, you can say important things by concentrating on the small. That's what Chekhov did. I, again, I wouldn't dream of comparing myself to Chekhov, but that's what he did. Um, and I think you can do that for ordinary people, because I do passionately believe in the poetry of the ordinary. I really, really do. Well, the fact that you don't have to, you know, the majority of us don't see car chases every day or mass murderers or people being blown to bits in slow motion. We don't. Our lives are much more ordinary than that. But what's important to us, if we're from an ordinary family, is that someone gets married or has a kid um, or dies. They're big, in, big things. Someone moves house. It's important. And I find that immensely moving because it's, it's small, but it has 
we can all share that. We all know what it's like to feel joy at someone getting married or having a child. We can all feel the pain of people dying. We all share that. I wish my dad was here. So when you look back on these five films, really, the trilogy, and Distant Voices and Long Day Closes, do you think that's a, a catharsis, or do you think it's a, a, a reclamation? No, I thought it would be a catharsis, but it wasn't. All it did is make me realise my sense of loss, and all that suffering, and what was it for? Nothing. But I suppose... If you record suffering, then, in a way, it gives it some kind of meaning. Um, I don't know what kind of meaning, but it does. Um, not to record, it seems to be even worse. But, no, it, it certainly wasn't a reclamation. Um, it certainly wasn't a catharsis. I suppose, if anything, it's made me look at it and think, well, it happened, and this is what I'm stuck with, and I've got to try and get on with it. And I do try and count my blessings. I, I do try. I don't always succeed, but I do try. <laughs> the Majestic, the Savoy, the Hippodrome, the Play-Doh. Judy Garland, Rock Hudson, Betty Davis, Cary Grant, Joan Crawford. All, all are gone. The old familiar faces. Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. But such a tide as moving seems asleep to fall for sound and foam, when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home. Yeah. Oh, Dad. Twilight and evening there, and after that, the dark. And may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out our bourne of time and place the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar.